Hi everyone, my name's Elliot Desi. I'm AD's National Training Manager. I'm really excited to be here today live at the AD Lab in Sittingbourne with Josh, our Head of Chemistry. Josh, how are we today? I'm fine, thank you, mate. Good. And Josh, can you just share a little bit about what you do at AD? What is it like being Head of Chemistry? Yeah, sure. So, as being Head of Chemistry, I head up both the chemistry testing services in terms of water samples and the chemical R&D lab in terms of our formulations. Fantastic. Great stuff. Well, I've had a really enjoyable day today, sort of having a tour around. Um, really interesting stuff going on here, Josh. And I think from a heat and engineer's perspective, you may have seen the AD water test kits uh, on the shelf, the domestic ones that you often see in the merchants. Um, and I guess, Josh, for me, it's just getting that understanding of what exactly do we do here? Because, you know, what, what are we testing for? What, when you send a sample to the lab, where does it go? What kind of things are we picking up on? And I guess just having that deep dive into water quality because as heating engineers most well probably all of you have experienced water quality related breakdowns you know um sludge problems all sorts of issues that you can get from from bad water quality so let's have a look at this josh because we've got some really interesting stuff here and yeah. i think i'd like you to just sort of share yeah sure what exactly this means and what we're looking at so when the water samples come in we are looking for both the both the non-metallic components and the metallic components along the solid components of the sample. So what we have here are a variety of live samples that have come in with varying amounts of solids and the type of solids that were in them. So by performing this test, we can quickly see how much solid is in the system along with what type of solid it is, and then we can prescribe a, a good solution to overcome that. Yeah. For example, um, both of these both these papers here were from samples that contained quite a lot of iron corrosion, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, however, one is black and one is orange, yet they've both got iron corrosion. So what that means is this system, along with having iron corrosion, was also suffering from a lot of air ingress problems, a lot of fresh water has been added, yeah. and this one is a sealed system. Because when left to its own devices, the iron corrosion it will, will preferentially be in this state, which is the Fe203, as opposed to the Fe304, which is the characteristic magnetite. Right, yeah, because I guess, yeah, really, that's what you see on a, on a magnet clean, isn't it? Mm. What's captured mm. on the magnet, and, yes. and I think it's an interesting one. So really then, if, if there's anyone call that has, um, you know, that, that job where you're not quite sure what's going on with the water quality, there's mm. a lot of rust, mm. you're not quite mm. sure the best way of treating it, really, that sending a sample here will give you that full analysis and you guys can give a recommendation of exactly what you think we should do to resolve the issue. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. And what's this one here, Josh? This kind of green... So green this sample. one here is an example, uh, again, of a system that had higher level of corrosion, but this time it was copper. Right, it, okay. It's that characteristic green colour. Yeah. Um, so we're in this situation, we can then prescribe that you need a cartridge filter instead of just simply a magnet. Because yeah. as we know, copper is not magnetic. Sure. The same way rust is not magnetic. So that's when you're in kind of cold flush territory, yeah, getting, yeah, absolutely. getting the water out, etc. But crucially, by doing this test, we can therefore actually prescribe a direct solution for that individual system's problem. Fantastic. Okay. And that's something that happens on all of our domestic testing when you send a sample This through. is the commercial testing. Commercial, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but we do do a lot of testing on the domestic for metallic and corrosion. Fab, okay. So um, just next then, so we've mm. got here, this is interesting, this is. So mm. we've got two containers, one with MC1 Plus inhibitor yep. on the right, one without on the left, which I must say, this was only done a couple of hours ago. And what I found very interesting is, I guess you could explain, Josh, we've got several different metals there, haven't we, spinning around in the water. And I guess, could we just explain to everyone, what are those metals and yeah, why? Sure. You know, what, are we, what are we trying to do here? So with these, these, these coupons are representing the metals that you would commonly find in a central heating system. Not only are, are they the type of metal, they're, the type, they're exactly the, the grade of metal that you would find. So we've got aluminium for heat exchangers, we've got copper for pipe work, mild steel for radiators, stainless steel, which can be used for heat exchangers also, brass for any fittings, and then a second coupon for mild steel. Wow. Um, as we said, these were set up just a couple of hours ago. And as you can see, the one that has not got any MC1 Plus inside 
has already started to show signs of corrosion and yeah. the, the fluid itself has started to go tinted with a characteristic iron colour. So I guess the question I've got really is, is you know, I, I would always use inhibitor. Yes. But I'll be honest, you know, I know that, you know, um, BS7593 mm -hmm. states that um, inhibitors should be tested for annually. Um, yes. And obviously, uh, it's something that boiler manufacturers will, will, will check for when, when um, they're doing a warranty call. So we know it's, mm -hmm. uh, we know it's a, a really good way of, of, of helping prevent this corrosion, as we can clearly see already. Um, I guess a question for you, Josh, is how exactly is it doing it? So I appreciate that I can see it with my eyes, but what, what's actually happening there? When we put an inhibitor in, what does MC1 Plus do? So MC1 Plus contains uh, quite a few ingredients that will inhibit the corrosion of the metals. So one aspect, and a very simple one, is that it keeps the system water buffered at a neutral pH. Okay. Because if the system water goes acidic, then you're going to start to get corrosion of any iron-based components. Yep. And if it goes alkaline, then you're going to get corrosion of any aluminium-based components. Aluminium will also corrode in the acidic conditions as well, but aluminium particularly will corrode in both acidic and alkaline conditions because it's known as what we call amphoteric. Right. So if you've got an aluminium heat exchanger, then you really need to be on top of your water quality yeah. and keeping the pH buffered at a neutral value. Secondly, it contains form filming ingredients, which then coat the inside of all the, si all the surfaces of the system. And again, this aids in the, in the inhibition of the corrosion. Wow, okay. So it's a lot, a lot going on really. When you, when, you, when you think about it, it's not just, it's, it's several things that like you said, it's yeah, pH. Yeah. It's, mm. And I guess touching on aluminium, that's mm. something now we, you know, we see not just in heat exchangers, but obviously a lot of radiators now, yeah, a lot yeah, of designer yeah. radiators yeah. tend to be aluminium. So um, it's surprising really how much aluminium you probably would start find on an average heating system now. Yes, so, yes, yes. Okay, fab. So um, let's have a little look at the, um, you mentioned about some of our, the domestic testing mm -hmm. um, and how you've kind of got separate tests. One, one, one's te detecting your kind of, your, your metallics and your metals and one's not. Mm -hmm. Should we have a look at the first one and see what's... Sure, so let's have a look at the, the non-metals first. Okay. So, as you would have seen in the merchants, these are the AD water testing kits. Uh, that they come in the merchants, they come with a pre-postage bag. Uh, you can simply take a water sample from the mains and the, the system. You can pop it into the prepaid bag, put it in the post, and then it, it will come to us the next day as it's a first class envelope. Uh, when the samples arrive here in the mornings, they're unpacked, they're sorted, and then, then we start to analyze them. Firstly, we are analyzing for the non-metals, so the pH, the conductivity, the hardness, and the chloride level. Um, these are very important analytes because if the pH, like I said, is too acidic or too alkaline, then you're going to start to get c corrosion issues. Yep. High levels of chloride will also give you tremendous problems with any iron-based components. So when we have the samples, we only need five milliliters of sample. And the way that we can do that is the samples are poured into these little cups and these are then barcoded. So each sample will have its own unique barcode. That's crucial for our UCAS accreditation to have, to have traceability of all the samples. Each sample is then peeled off and labeled on to the, onto the worksheets. Once that's happened, the analyst can then load the, the, the rack into the instrument. And then what happens then is the sample is analyzed for the analytes that we've requested. Um, how that happens is a very small proportion of the sample is aspirated up and placed into these cuvettes. And if you can see quickly, there's a little clear section on the bottom. Those little wells are where the analysis takes place. So each well will be one sample and one test. So sample one hardness, sample one chloride, mm -hmm. sample two, and, and so on. And then what happens there is the sample is added, the instrument is then blanked, as a start point, reagent is then added, and then what happens is there will be a chemical reaction inside, and then it is remeasured, and the amount of light that is now absorbed based on the light that was absorbed at the start, the increase in the absorbance is the amount of the analyte that you're looking to analyze, for example, hardness or chloride. And this will quite happily work away, automated, um, well over 150 samples a day, 
and we've got more than one instrument, which there, which that's what allows us to do the, the rapid speed of service. It allows us to get all the samples tested in the same day that we receive them through having higher levels of automated equipment. That's fantastic. It's such, I mean, it's a great bit of equipment. I think mm. some of the um, installers on the call, Josh, will mm. be familiar with the ProCheck test we do, like yeah. our on-site water test. Yes. Um, obviously, what I'm interested in, this is obviously uh, a, a much, a very, very in-depth test, yeah. basically, in, in, in total. I'd be interested to know kind of what are the parameters we're looking at here? Because I can see okay. it's, it's, it's obviously... Um, so here's an example of a domestic water test report. And with the project, we are looking for appearance, the corrosion and the inhibitor level and the pH. This, this will then break down the corrosion to each metal type. It will also allow you to detect for not only inhibitor, but whether or not ADMC1 plus has been used or not. That's crucial for any, for any specified jobs. Yeah. It will also give you a breakdown of other items that are not included in the project. For example, the hardness of the water, the chloride, and the conductivity. And those aspects are very crucial because hardness, for example, if the hardness has dropped dramatically from what the mains hard hardness was, mm -hmm. then the question is, where has the hardness gone? Yeah. And the answer to that is it's formed scale on heat exchanger surfaces and other areas that are hot inside the system. So by ascertaining the hardness of the system, you can then also report back to the customer if, if there's any issues with scaling, is the heat exchanger going to need any work doing to it yeah, in, yeah. The, in the future? So there's right. quite a lot of parameters yeah. that takes the project further. So really, for anyone looking for that deep analysis of the system, yeah. this really is going to give them every single element they can ever yeah, need, yeah, essentially. Yeah. So sure. great. So um, commercial testing. Sure. Let's have a look. Sure. So again, this is something that you may have seen in the merchants. Uh, it is the AD system diagnostic test kit. Uh, this is more suited to uh, the larger commercial systems that, that we find. Um, it works off of the same principle that you can take the samples, you pop it into the prepaid post bag that's included, we then get it, and then it's analyzed. However, this one, due to there being more analytes involved and some more time taken, this one is analyzed and sent back to the customer after three working days yep. from when we receive it. Um, for, furthermore, this offers more analytes than is available on the domestic kit to allow that further in-depth analysis of the larger commercial systems, which includes the solids analysis we saw at the start. Um, so with, the, with this one, where we can look at the level of the suspended solids, we look at then all the metal types, so al aluminium, copper iron, zinc, uh, both types of inhibitor you normally find in the commercial world. So in the domestic market, mal malibdate is the main source yep. of corrosion inhibitor. In the commercial world, a lot of people use either sodium nitrite and sodium malibdate mixes or just sodium nitrite. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay, and I can see next up we've got MC th MC35 commercial non-drain cleaner. Yes. So obviously this is one of our um, cleaners that is suitable just for commercial systems, uh, yes. Josh. But can you just talk a bit about that? Because obviously a non-drain cleaner, that's something something different, right? Yes. So with the non-drain cleaner, it has both a mix of cleaner and corrosion inhibitor in the same formulation. It also contains additives that allow for, the, for any solids that are in the system to be carried away they distribute, like remove from their from where they're sitting and carried away in the system flow to the filter, and that's quite crucial. If you're looking to put MC35 into a commercial system, then you will definitely need to have a filter fitted. This is due to well, when this lifts any any particular debris matter that's in there, and that will be carried along. It has to go somewhere, and if there's no filter if there's no filter fitted, then that yeah. will go straight to the heat exchanger and cause blockages. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. And um, we did have, well, while we're on cleaners actually, Josh, we did have a question come in um, sure. regarding our standard, it's going back to sort of domestic mm -hmm. systems now, but our standard MC3 plus yep. and our MC5 cleaner. Sure. And we had a question um, from somebody that was asking, what 
what exactly what is the difference between the two and, and you know when would you recommend one over the other so the difference between MC3 plus and MC5 there's a slightly different chemical balance inside uh, the MC5 is a cleaner that's more suited to a heavily sludged up system versus the MC3 uh, being slightly stronger the MC5 can only be left in the system for up to seven days okay yeah. whereas the MC35 can be left for up to 28 days um, both are great cleaners, but if you're looking to do a, a, a system flush on the same day, then the MC5 is the more suitable cleaner, as that gets to work a lot quicker than the MC3 due to the slightly different formulation of the product. Okay, fantastic. It works great with the magnet cleanse, so you can get in, get it flushed, and get cleaned and refilled in the same day. Yeah, okay, fab. So yeah, interesting. I think um, let's have a little look at the um, sort of metallics yeah, uh, sure. testing that you were talking about sure. as well. But that links quite nicely to what we're talking about, really, because I found this really interesting earlier today um, of exactly what this is, because this looks like some pretty advanced kit to me. Sure. So this is what's called an ICP, which stands for inductively coupled plasma. And this is the optical emission type. Um, what it is doing here is we're looking for the metal component of the sample. Yep. Um, we could analyze for most of the periodic table, uh, but we've currently got it set up for the elements of interest. So iron for radiators, uh, things like copper for pipe work, zinc, because you can alloy to make brass, yep. aluminium for heat exchanger material or uh, radiators. Some people still use borates, yeah. and molybdate as a key component of uh, corrosion inhibitors. And what's happening here is the samples are being aspirated up. So this is actually working away right now on live samples. Wow. Yeah. So the sample is then, is then aspirated up and goes through what's called the, the spray chamber. I found that really interesting because it's like a, it's almost like a mist, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's so inside the spray chamber, a little hurricane happens basically, and all of the larger droplets are thrown to the outside and then taken away to waste, leaving you just with a fine mist that is going up, as you can see here. Yeah. Um, that goes up into the into the plasma flame. So inside the box there is the argon plasma flame. Uh, that's ionised argon gas. And the tip of the flame there is around 10,000 degrees. So it's like the surface of the sun inside the box. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite hot. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty it's, hot. Yeah, yeah, it's warm. Um, so what happens then is the, when the sample goes up, though any atoms of metal that are in the sample are then bombarded with all the energy from the plasma flame. And we've all seen that classic picture at school of the atom with the, with the center nucleus yeah. and the electrons go around the outside. When they get hit with all, the, all that energy, the electrons then move to a higher orbit. When they come back down, all the energy which they gain, they send back out in the form of light. We know that white light is a mixture of all the colors of the rainbow. And what that means is all the colors of the rainbow are slightly different wavelengths of light. So when the atoms it send out that light, that is characteristic just of the wavelength that is characteristic of one element, the instrument can then see which light waves are coming out, along with how much of it's coming out, to see which metal's in there and how much of it's in there. Because each metal emits light, characteristic wavelength that only it will have. Wow. Fantastic. And we've got a second instrument to, again, allow us to have that high capacity throughput, that speed of service that our customers are expecting. It doesn't look like cheap equipment either, Josh, to me. No, it's certainly not cheap equipment. <laughs> that is, that is, it's that certainly is for sure. It's stuff. It's it is, it is, it is. Wow. So you go, guys, it gives you a really, you know, great insight into, into what happens when you send a sample and actually the, the quality that's been delivered here is, is, is phenomenal, to be honest. Um, I guess uh, another um, thing I wanted to speak to you about, Josh, was uh, MC1 Plus inhibitor, yes. okay? So we mentioned that it's performance tested. It is. Okay. Um, I've heard a little bit about sort of NSF, um, you know, ratings and approvals and so on. And I'm just really interested to sort of know when, when you performance test MC1 Plus, yes. what are you doing exactly? What test are we doing? Is, you know, and, and 
how can we sort of confirm that it's always you know good? So the so the NSF testing comprises of three parts. So the first part is the is the performance of the corrosion inhibition. Uh, the second part is the inhibition of scale formation. And the third part is how the chemical will interrupt with any rubber components, i.e. O-rings, gaskets, etc. Um, when we batch test it, we batch test every batch of MC1 Plus here at the lab for the cor corrosion performance testing. We then can see and ascertain how, that, how each batch will, will perform in a corrosion environment. We can then ascertain if the product has changed through batches, we can then keep our batch control quite tight. We can trend the data over time and to see how batches are varying over time. Um, when, you, when you go for the NSF accreditation, you, the, that lasts for five years. And you have to resubmit your product for testing, either to a accredited lab or to an independent lab, which then will send the results on to NSF for further review. That lasts for five years, and you must do it once every five years, or if you reformulate your product, because then you're not selling what you originally tested. Okay, yeah. However, we don't do it once every five years. We do it on every batch, which works out to being about one a week, wow. every week, continuously, and have ever done. So it's really setting that bar of, of consistent, you know, consistent product. It's yes. always going to deliver what it says. Mm -hmm. You always forget the performance we're describing. Yes, it's always going to give you the, the, the you know the, the correct treatment in yeah. liters to what says what it says on the bottle. So yeah, and every batch of, of MC1 Plus, as we said, gets sent here for testing, and it is not sold until we've actually completed that test. Then we know car categorically that that will work, and we'll do exactly what we said it to, should should do. Yeah, and then it is actually sold. So awesome. every bottle that is ever out there can be traced back to an NSF test here, and we can track back to who tested it, when was all the equipment calibrated and in date for every single test going wow. back about 10 years. It's fantastic. Yeah. I wish I was that organized. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's part and parcel of being in a lab. It's, that's, that's great. That is, that is really interesting stuff, to be fair. It's, um, yeah, it's just great to know that you've got that kind of consistency every, every time, isn't it, really? It's, it's also key to mention that we've had, you know, you know the, this, this, this uh, contains a lot of investment in this yeah. product. Yeah. You know, Lab equipment, as we briefly touched on, isn't cheap. Yeah. You know, we're talking six figures for most of the large items here. Yeah, yeah. So vast amounts of investments gone into this lab, but then it, in, but then it ensures that the quality of the product we're selling and the samples we're analysing, customers can then have those results with assurance that they are, they are spot on. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And I guess one thing as well that I've, I've heard a bit about is the fact that, you know, you mentioned UCAS. Yes. And obviously we are a UCAS accredited lab, and yes. we're the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but we're the only UCAS accredited lab that can actually carry out this performance testing of inhibitors as per NSF's yes, we are. requirements. Yes. So that's a, a great, you know, a great, yeah, a great that thing makes to us, have, really. But that makes us one of a kind, really. Yeah. To be the only UCAS accredited lab for the NSF testing yeah. is quite something special, really. Fantastic stuff. And we are a UCAS accredited lab for all of the other water testing here. Um, which the, again ensures full traceability of all the samples down to the analyst who performed it, when, and all the chemical reagents that have gone into that testing, were they in date, when were they last calibrated, when were they last checked. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to obtain that UCAS accreditation and then to keep that UCAS accreditation, but then it ensures the quality and reliability of the final results. Yeah, yeah fantastic. And I guess, um, obviously over here we've got some final bit of equipment here, Josh. So. What's this exactly? What's, uh... So this is an iron chromatography machine. Um, this is where we're looking for what we call anions. Okay. So, um, which are a lot of the anions that are based at this end of the periodic table. Yep. Um, so we're looking for things like fluoride, chloride. We can look for phosphates, sulfates, uh, nitrates and nitrites. A lot of the stuff on the, that side of the periodic table because they are all minus, they're all minus ions. They're all, they're all uh, negatively charged. Yep. And what happens here is, with chromatography, it's simply the splitting up of a sample into its constituent parts. So for example, we have a continuously flowing stream of eluvent, and then the sample is, is injected into, this, into that flowing stream. Okay. As it moves through the separation column here, 
uh, all of the anions will travel through the column at a varying speed. So some come off really quickly, some travel quite slowly. And what happens is the instrument is constantly monitoring the conductivity of the background flow in the eluent. And when all of the same anion group together and then come off the column, there's a sudden spike in the conductivity when they come off. For example, when the background flows through and then there's a sudden spike, that's fluoride, and then back down again. And then there's nothing for a while, and then there's a big spike, and then that's chloride. And down again, and then nitrite, and so on. And what happens is, as this constantly flowing eluent progresses, all of the anions are coming off at slightly, slightly different times. And that's all it is. It's just the separation of different constituent parts of a sample. That's what chromatography is. Everyone would have done that, again, the classic experiment at school with the paper and the, and the ink dot and the water and the water goes up the paper yep. and the ink dot separates that into all of the colours that that ink was made of. That's all chromatography is. It's just the splitting up of something into its constituent parts. Fantastic. And there's different ways of doing it. There's liquid chromatography, there's gas chromatography, there's paper chromatography. There's different ways. But this one is the ion chromatography which are looking for the anions of interest in closed loop systems. I think, I mean, what I found really interesting earlier, Josh, we were talking about um, dissolved metals in water. Yes. And how if you've got dissolved metals, um, it's, you know, it's, it's essentially become part of that water at that point. Yes, it has. Um, and I don't know if you want to just share, you, you put a really good point earlier about kind of sand in water versus sugar in the water. I thought it was a really good way of putting it. So, for me to understand yeah, sure. What you're so well, when we're talking about metals that are in the water dissolved, we're talking about they are no longer in the water as solid particulate matter. Yeah. They have, like you said, they have become part of the water. A common analogy to translate that back would be if you had two cups of, of water and you placed sugar in one cup and sand in the other, mix them up, the sugar will dissolve and become part of the water. You can't just filter it out. Whereas the sand will stay as a particulate matter, which you can then pass through a filter and actually remove those solids. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a crucial, crucial distinction is when something is dissolved in the water, it becomes part of the water. And the only way to then remove that is to remove the water because I, you cannot yeah. skim it out. And I guess really that's when from a kind of a remedial work perspective, that's the difference between, you know, cold flushing the system and getting the water out and actually using the magnet lens process mm -hmm. to extract the magnetite because there, there are particles there to extract. And yes. I think that was a red, it really kind of struck me that day. There's a really yeah, good way of putting it. Yeah, and it really is true because if, if the particulates are no longer existing as particulate, then you can't get, they're in the water physically and you can't see them, they're in the water and you can't just f filter them out, yeah. either through magnetic filtration or through cartridge filtration. And I guess one thing I want to touch on as well is the fact that obviously it's quite, quite evident here that the, the, the chemicals that are, that are being tested and, and to the standard is, is, is phenomenal. You know, it's, it's a fantastic facility. So obviously we, we can vouch for the quality of the chemicals, but I guess what I find interesting is, is actually how our chemicals can work in conjunction of one another. So it's not just that we've made good individual chemicals, but you've mm. actually thought about how, how I mean, a good, a good example would be MC3 or MC5 cleaner. Mm. And if you put a, a cleaner into the system, you can actually use MC1 plus inhibitor, yes, and that will neutralize up to 20% of remaining cleaner. So, I know you know from a from a flushing perspective, it's always crucial that that you know we we get the cleaner out of the system, yes, and we and we do everything we 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 can to achieve that. But I guess from that kind of extra buffer and peace of mind, Josh, to know that if you follow up with this product, yes, you, you've got that a little bit of protection there, haven't you? To, absolutely, to kind of, kind absolutely. Of so, as you said, if you do use the chemical cleaners to clean a system uh, and you flush it out or there's a hard to reach area that you just can't get out or you may even forget to do one, well, one leg or one radiator or even if there is a dead leg, um, then what happens is when you add the MC1 Plus inside, uh, it, will be, it has the capacity to neutralize any remaining cleaner uh, that's that's in there so you won't pose any problems ongoing with the with the cleaner residues in there um, which is quite crucial 
to then to ensure that even if you can't get it all out and you add MC1 Plus afterwards, then the system will still be fine. Yeah. And as we said, these all work in conjunction. So the cleaner will be good for cleaning a system. This will, this will neutralize some of this one. But crucially, you can use MC10 Plus and MC1 Plus together in underfloor heating systems. So yeah. systems that are uh, running at a low, lower temperature, i.e. underfloor heating systems, or with the advent of Part L recently, with a change in the flow temperatures. Yeah. Um, we're seeing that biocide is becoming more and more of an essential chemical that is needed to be added into systems. And I guess you reference Part L there, Josh, mm. um, and you reference obviously lower temperatures. So yeah. and many of you on the call will, will know this, but if you don't, um, the, the details basically are is that any heating system now going in, regardless of its fuel type, so if it's a heat pump or if it's a mm -hmm. gas boiler, mm -hmm. if it's a full heating system, as in new rads as well, underfloor heating, new pipe work, so mm -hmm. we're putting put a system in from scratch, we should be, where possible, designing heating systems to run no hotter than 55 degrees. So mm -hmm. I appreciate it, not in, in not all cases you can achieve that, obviously, depending on the insulation of the property, yeah. but ultimately, you know, it's trying to do the best job you can to run the system at a lower flow temperature to help with, with efficiency. And I guess, you mentioned biocide, I think it's just important really to touch on what exactly is it for? So you've mentioned lower temperature. Mm. Um, why do we need biocide? Why, why is it part of, of, of BS7593 now? So when you're running your central heating system at a lower temperature, or with underfloor heating in particular, you've got water that's, that's not getting hot enough to self-pasteurize or to self-clean itself. So what happens is the water will start to have bacteria growing in it and other growths like algae, for example, and other bacterial forms. Um, as we've known for centuries as being people and human beings, water doesn't store well. Left to its own devices, water never stores well. Yeah. Any water that is considered to be not flowing or any water that is stagnant, you just know it, it's not going to end well. I guess things like hot tubs, hot you've, tubs. Got, you've got to put chemicals in, you've got to put, um, you know, you've got to test for pH, haven't you? You've got to kind of keep on top of the water, don't you? So yeah. I guess if you're not doing that, yeah. you lift the lid up, come, come summer it's been closed or winter and you've got film all over the top of it, mm. that's really what you're referring to, I guess. Absolutely. So uh, in terms of the well, biocide, especially for the underfloor heating systems, you get um, bacterial growth and biofilms that are building up inside on the pipework. Um, and when you've got the underfloor running at a low temperature, you know, in the 20s, you only need a few millimeters of biocide or of biofilm growth. Yeah. And that will quickly impede the heat transfer of the water into the floor. And because you're only starting in the mid 20s to start with, a couple of degrees off from where you set it is quite a big percentage. Mm. If you set it at 25, but you're only getting 22 or 21 out of it, that's a big proportion of the heat that's been lost through not much biofilm growth. And by adding the MC10 plus biocide, it will prevent the growth of these biofilms and bacteria. And the biocide itself is uh, specifically formulated for closed loop systems. Mm -hmm. and, it is a, and it contains more than one active ingredient. So it is very good at being specifically targeted for closed loop systems and bacteria that you'll find in closed loop systems. Fantastic, okay. Well, guys, I hope you've enjoyed our, our tour uh, this evening. I really appreciate you um, spending a bit of time and, and, and listening to Josh, Josh uh, talk about this. It's really interesting stuff. So I think next time you're in the merchant, keep an eye out for an AD water test um, and biocide. If you haven't seen that before, obviously it's uh, you know different um, product now. And um, Josh, any last points? Well, I mean, it's been great to, to do this tonight, and uh, yeah, and really good. Cool. Thanks, guys. We'll see you again. Bye bye.